much for coming today. I'm Pam Schaff, by the way, and um, I'm the director of the HEAL program, and today's exhibit continues HEAL's um, mission to align the work of artist patients with our medical school curriculum and to foster enhanced understanding between patients and future healthcare professionals. Today, we're really excited to have the work of our own artist in res residence, Ted Meyer, um, here as as the artist and as one of our discussants. And um, he'll be in conversation with Dr. Simi Raman, who I'm sure many of you know, but she is a pediatric hospitalist at LA County and is assistant professor of pediatrics. And Ted and Simi actually have, um, I've been t told, I haven't had a chance to explore yet, but they do a webcast on The Mighty, which is a website that allows patients um, to share their experiences, artist patients to share their experience of illness. And so they host these um, conversations on, on this website, and they also um, have the Art and Med website. So explore when you have a moment. And last but not least is Dr. Susan Downey, who is um, a professor of medical education and surgery here at USC. Some of you know her as a PPM mentor, taking a year off with me this year, but we were co-mentors together. So it's great to have you back. And um, Dr. Downey is a plastic surgeon, so she's going to be talking about um, some of the work that we are going to see today. So with that, I will turn it over to Ted and Simi and Dr. Downey. Thank you, Pam. Um, I'm so excited today um, to share Ted's work um, called the Scarred for Life series. Um, so we're going to jump right in. Um, Ted, you began the Scarred for Life series about 20 years ago um, at a crucial juncture in your life um, as a person living with Gaucher's disease. Now, what was going on in your life at that time? So. I've talked about this at some of the other talks. So I have Gaucher's, which is a lysosomal storage disorder illness. I was very sick growing up, but at a certain point when I was in my early 40s, uh, a treatment came up for this illness. NIH developed a new treatment, and I started on it, and a lot of my symptoms disappeared. So for years, from the time I was little until my 40s, I did artwork about myself. And then when my pain and my fatigue and a lot of my symptoms disappeared, I was sort of at a loss as to what to do with my life artistically. And I decided that I would do work about other people's illnesses because I like the narrative aspect of talking about illness and doing art, but I, I had nothing to say about myself. I thought, I'll do work about other people. So I started this SCAR series and it started out showing one or two people at an art show and everybody came up to me and started telling me about their scars and undressing in the gallery and unbuttoning their shirts and pulling down their pants and everybody wanted to tell me their stories and I realized that this was a reaction I had never gotten as a painter. So, you know, when you get a lot of encouragement, you keep going in that direction. So that's that's what's happened. That's wonderful. So, there, you know, you, uh, the process that you uh, undergo when you bring a person in to do one of these prints, can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so everybody, I never really ask people to do this. They all volunteer. So what, what's become apparent over the years is that people, although doctors might tell them they're healed, they still want to tell their story. They want people to know that they've had struggles and that they've survived these major life experiences. So people come into the, my studio, which is, it was right over here at the brewery for a while, now it's down the street. And we sit and we talk for about a half hour about their scar. How did they get it? What was the experience like? But for me, as somebody who was sick and then had to put a life together as a healthy person, I'm most interested in what most of these stories you see around you focus on is how did people put their lives together after some sort of catastrophic upheaval in their their medical life so we sit and we talk about that and then I try to add bits of that information into the drawings can you point at maybe a couple of pieces where some of the narrative has kind of made it into the print yeah so this the first one over here the the woman on the right she had uh, a, a tumor on the inside of her pelvis 
that she was told by 14 doctors was inoperable. And the reason it became inoperable, if you look on the drawing, there's four calendars up there. From the time she applied to her insurance company to have an MRI done to find out what was going on, it took them 123 days to okay her MRI. And the tumor grew so large that by then they had to take out her pelvis to save her life, and as a result, her leg. So I try to work in what's going on with the people into their print. So it's not just making a pretty piece of art, but it really is their narrative. That's such a powerful piece to me always. I always look at that, and it reminds me that as a physician, it's so important to think about the per patient's perspective and what they're going through and what a denial of coverage means or waiting for something means. Um, that's always been a really powerful message for me. Um, so what was happening in these scar printing sessions? So you were putting... So the process is pretty simple. I roll ink on the people, and I pull a print off them. It's almost like a big fingerprint. And then I go back into them, I let them dry, and I paint back into them. But what's interesting is the same as with you guys when you're finally out there on the floor and you're dealing with patients. Sometimes I'm the first person to touch their scar. And, there's, and for me as an artist, you know, I'm rolling ink on people and pressing paper on them and there's, there's like a real sort of sensuality mm -hmm. to this contact that you normally wouldn't get. Because as an artist, a lot of times you're in your studio and you're by yourself. But this is, this is really a partnership between them allowing me to, to touch them, roll ink on them, to hear their personal mm -hmm. stories. So it's a very 50-50 thing. And I've heard you say that um, these are scars that people have hidden for years that are, sh you know, are connected to some sort of tragic or, vul you know, kind of... Um, a traumatic experience in their life, and for some reason it's that healing touch. There's, there's something happening in that process. It, well, it depends on the, the person. Mm -hmm. So on the middle wall here, this red one, this is a guy who was a, a veteran, and he had 43 operations to sort of put his leg together after an explosion from uh, in Iraq. And he said for years he hid everything and then he hit a certain point where he was like, I went through this, I earned these. And now he sort of shows them proudly and when people say what happened to your leg mm -hmm. or your eye or her arm, he's got scars all over him. He mm -hmm. tells the story because now he realizes that he survived and in one of the interviews I've seen of him, he says, well, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have my daughter and I wouldn't have my wife. And mm -hmm. So again, that's, to me, this whole project is about surviving and telling the story from the point when someone like you are done with the people, what, mm -hmm. what happens to them. Yeah, I love that aspect of taking a moment, taking a space, creating a space where you can then say, this is what happened, this is how I look at it right now, and then kind of anchoring it down so you can move past it maybe, or heal from it. There's a lot of processes happening. And I think as physicians, that's what we always hope to be doing, um, is not just curing and fixing, but also healing. Um, and I think that can segue a little bit into Dr. Downey. Uh, you're a reconstructive surgeon. Uh, you work a lot with uh, women who are recovering from breast cancer and reconstructing their image. Um, and, and we thought that would be a great experience, you know, experience to talk about, um, that difference between fixing and curing versus healing. Yeah. So can you speak to that? Well, you know, we as plastic surgeons um, get involved in a lot of these and deal with a lot of patients with either deformities that are, or differences. It's hard to come up with the right word to say and you try to say it in some way that's not as judgmental as say deformity or disfigurement and try to say maybe a difference. Um, for you know, children that are born with uh, congenital things such as a cleft lip, and then of course also dealing with the parents that are dealing now with a baby that's not the perfect baby they were expecting because they have a visible deformity and their fears about the future in this. And then also when we meet patients who are going to be undergoing uh, cancer treatment and you know, trying to get past with the cancer surgeons like, well, we're gonna cure you, and then we're trying to put them back and get them some semblance of normalcy again and try to put them back even though it'll be different but a new future going forward and the difficulty is 
so many ways you sometimes don't know what the fears the patients have, what's going to happen, what they don't know later, and what we'll say is, oh, it looks wonderful, it's healed beautifully because we were so pleased with the mechanics of the flap we've done or the, you know, the difficult reconstruction we've done, but it doesn't look so well for them because there's scars now that are visible and hidden there. I mean, the word plastic surgery, does anybody know where the, how, why we're called plastic surgeons? Anybody know where the word plastic comes from? Any Greek scholars in the room? Nobody? <laughs> to change, to bend or shape. It's from the word plasticos. And that's why we're called plastic surgeons, is because we bend or shape tissue to reform a new place. So what we do is we take tissue from somewhere else, often, and or use the local tissue to rearrange it into a new shape. And that's why plastic bottles are called plastic, because they can be bent and shaped into multiple shapes. The same reason we're called plastic surgeons. Of course, when people first meet plastic surgeons, they see you even with your name tag on in the elevator, they go, oh good, I won't have to have a scar. And we're like, no. <laughs> we're just, we're surgeons that use the tools to try to minimize scars and we try to place scars where they're less visible um, and do things, try to, you know, put them in natural skin creases or folds or places that we, we learn the normal first. You can't reconstruct unless you know the normal. So, for example, I can draw a normal ear. I'm sure most people in this room cannot, they have to think about it. You've looked at many ears, but you've never actually drawn one. But we have to know the normal in order to try to reconstruct it and try to get it so that it looks normal. And so what we try to do is we try to place scars somewhere where they're not so visible. Like if I put a scar on the face, if I put it in the nasolabial fold here, you expect to see a shadow or crease there so you don't notice the scar as well. So if we can, we try to do that and place the scars in somewhere that's less visible. What? That's wonderful. So, I mean, we have a lot of medical students here who um, haven't yet decided who they're going to be when they grow up. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit to like what led you to this um, aspect of medicine and what appeals to you? Sounds like you loved gross anatomy. Am I correct? Uh, <laughs> Maybe not. Um, it's okay if you don't love gross. You can still be. I, you know, I when I I've talked to a lot of my students who I see in the room here about when I was making my decisions. It was uh, I think I was deciding between. Surprised at like surgery as much as I did. Um, I think I'm a problem solver, that's why I liked it. Um, and I was actually deciding between pediatrics and surgery, so I decided that I would do be a pediatric surgeon was my first choice. And so I applied to surgery and I was in my surgical rotations. They kept sending me to Children's Hospital Philadelphia. I did my general surgery at Penn because people would, some guy broke his legs, they sent me back there. Somebody else did something else. I spent most of my <laughs> second year, I think, at Children's Hospital Philadelphia and was not enamored by pediatric surgery because it was either kids with hernias that got better um, or devastating illnesses. And I started, I was rotating you know, through the breast service and at that time we used to admit people the night before and talk, I admitted five women for mastectomies the next day and I remember this 35 year old woman who said, you know, started asking me questions about reconstruction and I didn't know anything and she said, you're gonna be a woman in surgery. There weren't many back then. Um, that we should, uh, you should learn something about this. And I started paying attention to what the plastic surgeons were doing afterwards and got interested in that and switched from general surgery into plastic surgery. So I did three years of general surgery and switched into plastic surgery because a spot opened up where I'd gone to medical school at Columbia. And I jumped on that spot and took it. And then when I finished my plastic surgery, I, uh, residency, I was trying to talk myself into microsurgery, which is the, you know, it's the hottest topic at that point, but realized the day of the week I liked when I was on the hand rotation was pediatrics. And so I was reading about pediatrics on Monday when it was on Friday, when I should be reading about the cases for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So actually came out here and did a fellowship at Children's Hospital, was the first pediatric plastic surgery fellow. So I came back to the cycle of pediatric surgery. <laughs> Can't and, stay away. And, and it was a pediatric, and was at Children's for 10 years, and then the weight loss patients uh, started, the bariatric program started here, and Gary Antone and I met at that, literally with his first patient. And that was hugely exciting because you're really reshaping people's lives, and we were inventing operations and developing new operations, and it became a big part of my life. I was one of the six of us doing that in the country mm -hmm. when it first started. And, That's fantastic. And always doing breast recon all the way along during yeah. that, so different I love jobs that. within plastic surgery. That, I love that. I love that even from the beginning of your career, you heard what your patients were saying. You, you went to where the need was each time and what appealed to you and you were really focused on and um, what it was that interested you in, in the various areas. Um, now to kind of segue a little bit into, you know, the, I see a parallel between what you're doing with your patients, with your 
patients <laughs> with your SCAR subjects and what we're doing with our patients, which is we're asking them to come into the room, let us know their deepest vulnerabilities, and they're asking us to heal them in some way. And you're both healing people in different ways. So we actually have one of our um, SCAR print subjects over here, Bruce, and we'd really love to hear from him as to what that process was like. I have to say that his was the most fascinating story. It's the one in purple over there um, with the scar in his abdomen. And um, if you want to just tell that story a little bit. And, okay. Yeah. Um, we'll show him your hand first. The hand or the shark bite? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am, uh, the timing couldn't be better because my doctor was a plastic surgeon. And I was super fortunate. When I had my accident, I... Uh, okay, first you have to explain, do not play with fireworks. Yeah. See, I got a, I got a butte there, too. So um, I uh, made a bunch of fireworks. They were fine. Pulled one out of the ground. It blew up. I became the human uh, Roman candle. And uh, both my hands look like open-faced burritos. I have before and after shots on my website, if you'd like to check those out later. <laughs> um, but I had a family friend who was a plastic surgeon specializing in hands. And serendipity touched my event all the way through. Um, a team of five worked on me for ten and a half hours, put me back together. When I came to, uh, my pinky was reattached. The hole in my hand that was the size of a silver dollar was closed up. This hand was completely reconstructed and attached to my stomach. Uh, a couple veins were pulled out of my foot to uh, increase circulation, to try and stave off some of the things that were to come. Um, my hand being sewn to my stomach was also a serendipitous touch back. 43 years earlier, a small girl in Berlin, Germany, had uh, electrocuted herself on a brass lamp. And uh, the hospital they took her to was going to sever her fingers. And a surgeon there said, hey, uh, we're trying a new thing at the university hospital. We're sewing limbs back into the stomach, create blood supply. And my mother had her stomach sewed to her finger and was able to uh, kind of relate as the uh, events happened. Also, I have to say, I was blessed with the best doctor. He had uh, a very conservative attitude as I lost my fingers one by one and they were taking them as they went. Um, he was always positive on what could be done and what could come with technology and things. But he, the best piece of advice he gave me when I uh, left after three months of the ICU, I, he said, a lot of people are going to approach you to uh, get a prosthetic or do something else with it. But take a couple years, beat the hell out of it, and see what you can do. Now, I have to say, <clears throat> some things were harder than others. The hardest tasks were things like learning how to tie your shoes with one hand or learning how to water ski again, pulling yourself out with, with one hand. But all of those things, it couldn't have been better advice. It couldn't have, have been better. That's wonderful. Thank you. I can tell you're still emotional about it. And, and well, it's, just... it's who you are. Um, and also, it's, it's not like uh, it happened to somebody else. You know, when you bring these, when I mean, you bring other people in and you invite people in, mm -hmm. there's meaning to all those things. Mm -hmm. I still um, think of my doctor as one of my best friends. He's passed years ago, but just a brilliant man mm -hmm. and uh, heavy impact. That's wonderful. And that's so wonderful for you to share that with our students, that the story, the, the, the telling of the story to different people at different places at different times um, is something that is a process that you've been going through. I mean, you did this print years ago, yeah. um, and you're here today to talk about it, and it's still relevant and obviously impactful. So thank yeah. you. Sure. Do you have a question for these guys? 
Do I have questions for these guys? How many want to be uh, plastic surgeons? <laughs> <laughs> How many like surgery? Okay, so a few hands. That's, That's not good. bad. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Well, I have, a, I have a question. So you were talking about your observational skills. You, you know what an ear looks like. Did you take life drawing? Did you take any kind of drawing skills, or are you just that good at observing? No, um, there are quite a few plastic surgeons that do have artistic talents, and they actually always at our national meetings, there's sculpting classes and things like that, the people that do that. And one of my um, partners, former partners, who's now retired, took up pottery afterwards because he needed something he did with his hands. But no, it's more observational skills and you know learning what the normal is and expecting, because the normal isn't the perfect either. You're not gonna learn what the perfect is, you wanna learn what the normal is or what symmetry is. Symmetry is very important. So you want to balance one side of the face or balance one side of the body versus the other. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, let's say if we can talk about a patient experience or um, an experience you've had with a patient of yours where um, things didn't go right, then things didn't go as expected, and, or they were dissatisfied with the results. Um, what's that like when, when you have to, you know, kind of, as a physician, enter into that conversation? Yeah. Well, that, that is, um, can be very difficult where, like I spoke to the fact that people think plastic surgeons can make everything disappear. Um, and a lot of education that goes on from early on. And just, I think, you know, when you realize something's not connecting with the patient, you realize that they're in, you're in the room with them and you're saying, okay, everything looks like it's fine. And they're looking at you with a sort of askance look and you realize that there, something's not there and you have to ask what's bothering you, what's, what's the issue, what can we talk about, what can we do? and then trying to talk about what we can do to fix something or what we can't do to fix something um, and what the realistic expectations are. And often it's just that patients want to know that there's um, you know, what all the opportunities that have been offered. And we do, similar to your experience with your plastic surgeon, often offer, you know, we're improving all the time. So right now there's not much we can do, but check back, we're changing. I mean, things we're doing now I wasn't doing when I first started in practice. It's amazing what we've been able to accomplish and change. So giving, leaving the window of hope open and opportunities for things later that we can do are really helpful. And often you could see the patient sort of relieved sort of that you're listening to them and you accept that this is not what you know, they would like. But you know, based on whatever happened in the beginning, you know, whether it was cancer or an accident or birth defect or something, get where did that point there? I want to sort of go back to what Bruce was saying, how the surgeon was smart enough to say to him, give it some time. So with all these scar prints, it's been very interesting because some people call me before they even have an operation and they say, as soon as I'm done, I want to come in and get a print done. And then other people will put it off. They're like, I want to do it. I'm just not ready. I'm two, right. two or three years down the road. And I was wondering if, sort of following up on Simi's question, are there people that you think like, okay, I saved your life. I gave you a life back and they're dissatisfied because they have a, a scar and that's all they can focus on, but maybe two years later they came back and go, I was, I was a little too adamant about worrying about the scar when you've given me quality of life, you've given well, me. Well, you know, there's different way, places patients may have their anger. They may have their anger on the fact that they have the disease in the first place. It depends, um, whether it's a cancer and why did I get this and what happened to me. Um, you know, Mothers with children with deformities, I mean, why did this happen to me? I did everything you know, I possibly could, and here I am with this baby now with a problem. Um, or anger if it was an accident, I mean, if it was a car accident, and you know, somebody else caused this to them. And so sometimes the anger is onto the surgeon, sometimes it's onto the family members. It can be difficult to sort all that out and try to help patients through the acceptance of this is the new reality going forward. And it can be, you know, sometimes it has to be a little bit of tough love, like we have to, you know, this is where we are now, let's move forward and let's get going there. Um, and other times it's, you know, just letting them express their anger that this could have happened to them and it's not fair. And just saying, yeah, you're right, it sucks, it's not fair. Now what are we gonna, you know, how are we gonna get forward in this? What I think is interesting too is that, you know, a lot of, like you said, your patient from the, the war vet hid all his scars and how much impact a, what we call a hidden deformity or hidden discrepancy 
I, when I was at Children's, I had probably the largest practice in the country of um, girls with congenital breast problems. And nobody had ever seen it, even they hadn't even shared it with their mothers. And it was um, the usual story I'd hear, the mother would come in going, oh my God, I had no idea when she said there was something wrong with her breast that they were so different. Literally like a D cup on one side and an A on the other or something like this. And she's, mother had sort of poo-pooed it, oh, everybody's a little bit different. And the girl had, you know, and then she walked in on her. Typically, it was when she was putting away laundry, the mother would walk in on the teenager when she was changing and see this. And the huge impact this would have on these girls' lives when they, it's something that they, nobody knew, nobody knew what was going on. And then when we were able to address it and adjust it and the changes in these girls' personalities and their identity and their social behavior was immense. That was one of the first, I think that's when I probably knew us pediatrics was again when I had one of those teenagers when I was at, in my residency. And she came in with her hair long, covering her face, wearing a huge oversized sweatshirt. Again, a C cup on one side, A cup on the other. We augmented one side and reduced the other. And she came back and left her mother outside. Her mother didn't do any more talking. And the, the girl was dressed and hair done, makeup done, everything. And huge change in their personality. And I think perhaps yours getting out things out in the open where they can talk about it probably helps a lot in the healing process. Well, when I started the project, it was pre-Iraq war. And we weren't used to seeing people with blades and big scars, like th there's been a major acceptance of sort of body differences, uh, especially amputations and things since the war. So I want to ask, so if you look over here, there's the second print over mm -hmm. with the Ganesh on it. So that's a woman, Indian woman, who had a small scar on her face. And if you read her story, she talks about her mom saying to her, you know, you should get that fixed because you'll never find a husband, you'll never, you know, and granted that sort of old, old, older thinking, but when you're dealing with patients, do you see a big difference in dealing with men or women? Because for men, it's kind of cool. You got a scar. It's, it's a huge difference. I mean, Tommy Lee Jones is a major actor with a lot of acne scars. Yeah. You don't see a lot of female actors with uh, acne, scar, acne scars. So it is a much bigger difference. And, Again, going back to my children's days, it was, I remember there was this car accident and this, we spent hours picking glass out of this young girl's face and the father's first words to me were, will anybody ask her to the prom? And she was about five at the time and he immediately went to there. You know, is this gonna be you know, a little girl with a facial scarring? Is it gonna be a difference? And I think it is a big difference in men and women um, accepting that. And it's, I don't know how to, you know, you deal with that. I mean, I think some people overcome it with personalities or, you know, but it's tough. Um, I've seen some amazing parents raising wonderful kids, very self-confident despite, you know, facial differences. Um, it's, a, it's a tough road. I mean, it's building the self-esteem, building the identity, uh, but still when you walk in a room and you see something, it's different. It's, you know, somebody, oh, didn't expect that, you know, so it's, it's tough. I love what you're talking about here about the role of the physician that expands beyond just the scientific, you know, the technical, the skills-based piece and really goes out to this idea of who you are as a person to these people who are coming to you. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that's evolved over time or is that something that you kind of came into medicine knowing uh, and being aware of? Uh, were there role models that you um, emulate when you, when you think about that? Well, I think, um, you know, my father was a physician. He was a chairman of rehab medicine at Columbia University. And so he dealt with a lot of spinal deformities. And I remember as a kid, you know, him be, watching him once with uh, one of my brother's classmates at Yale got paralyzed over the summer in a diving accident. And I saw my dad interact with him and I thought it was, I, well, I thought he was more abrupt than I thought he should have been, but he's like, you know, this is the new normal, let's go forward and let's move where we are now. And so I think I did have a role model there. I think uniquely plastic surgery has this, we operate on children, not only people from birth to death, but I also have long-term follow-up that I know the other surgeons in my hospital are jealous of sometimes because I've had one of my, I've operated one of my teenagers who's now in her 30s, um, came back and 20 years later, I just saw I have another one of my, I've, I've, a lot of patients I've had for 20, 25 years. Um, one of my cleft lips sends me a picture every year and it was one of the first I did as a, you know, this, it's really, it's really unique that you get to see the evolution and, you know, 
follow patients through their lives as they yeah. change and they come back in now and you've operated on them 20 years ago and now they're married and they have their own kids and you know and sometimes I get calls like is this going to happen to my child or is this uh, something I have to worry about genetics and this or anything else and you know it's it's That's wonderful in plastic surgery that you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Which we've is why talked I never about changed my name, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've talked about that too is that, you know, when we go through our day, our panel of like 15, 20 patients, um, you know, that can be, become a blur. But for that patient, you can be that one doctor that made a difference. Um, and so, kind of trying to get into that mindset of how can I be the person you need me to be at this moment? Uh, and maybe I can go to you and, and your childhood of, of meeting different doctors yeah. and, and the so, evolution. Well, I was, I was in New York, so I was at uh, Mount Sinai, and I was, you know, I was the crazy, freaky kid with the rare illness. At the time, there were only about 250 known cases. And I was constantly being poked and prodded. And the reason I got into doing this work and how I landed up here working with Pam and you is because I would listen to all the stories. As I did all these SCAR projects, I would hear everybody's stories. And a lot of them were the things that doctors did right and things doctors did wrong. And, and then I sort of thought, well, maybe, maybe I can take this group of group of stories and this, I don't know what to say, life experiences that I kept hearing over and over again and sort of give it to you guys through art. Yeah, Have you had any contact with patients who somebody had recommended that they see you and then they've refused at talking to people that don't want to have this done? Well, I, as I said, I only, I never ask people, they volunteer and they find me from all over the world. I get emails all the time from places, I'm going to be in LA, can I do your print? But I do have friends that say they have said to their friends, you should do this, and their friends like, I'm, again, as you know, sometimes people are ready to deal with it, sometimes they're not, you know, well, so. I've, I've definitely had that experience yeah. of a person who went through a heart transplant and has a pretty interesting scar and was really active before and obviously is no longer able to be and hasn't really gotten over it. Um, and that's emblematic of his, he kind of like pops up every couple of years and says, oh, I see what you're doing with Ted, that's great. I was like, oh, if you want to get a scar print made, it's great. And he just disappears back, just not ready. You know, just not ready to let that part go or move past it. So it is an interesting, um, you know, roadmap through illness or, or, uh, or a point on, on this roadmap through illness that you've created um, and, and made it visual. Um, and made it available to us as a teaching tool. I mean, how wonderful to be able to see that. And I want to, your uh, point about having patients that you've followed up, and I, I, if you guys have been in other of these events, I always say this, but one of the things, hearing all these stories, it takes a different temperament to pick a different specialty. And if you want to follow up with your patients, do this, have patients that have MS or something that's long term and you'll get to know their kids and their grandkids and if you don't have that temperament work in the emergency room and they're going to come in and you will never see them again yeah I, I've heard somebody was I used to be over at that other school on the other side of town and the first day I was there hanging up art and they didn't know who I was they just thought I was you know some worker and Two of the kids were going, yeah, I'm going to be an anesthesiologist because I don't want to have to talk to anybody. <laughs> so not only, like, figure, Good. <laughs> not only figure out what you like to do, but you know, do you like interacting with people and do you want that long-term relationship or do you just want to do your work and go home and... Yeah, I mean, there's definitely such a diversity. Uh, I mean, just to talk about medicine and knowing yourself, knowing what you enjoy, but also the kind of work you want to do and kind of thinking about at the end of your life, at the end of your career, what do you want to have been known for? What do you want to have been, you know? Who do you want to have been? And on the other side, you know, as a patient, I think, I think patients and doctors go through the exact same process. Um, I think as, as, a physician, as a patient, you're also looking at your life as a, you know, w what do I want this to mean? Um, and, and what does it mean? And how do I explore it? So self-knowledge is probably the first place um, that I would, uh, you know, kind of uh, hook, you know, get my hooks into. But um, from that, I think we can move to getting some questions from the audience. Oh. 
I just wanted to hear a little bit, maybe from Bruce, but also from you, Ted, about the experience of um, that the patients have shared with you. Like when they when they do come to find you, uh, Bruce, did you find him? And what was that like? And um, what what was your experience before, during, and after? Ted and I met in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't even drink, but I still hang out in bars. <laughs> it's okay. No, uh, we met in uh, Arts District in L.A., and uh, we have a lot of mutual friends, and I had known Ted uh, through this project, had this project going for a while. And uh, the, the process, is, for me, it's... I've always been pretty free and easy with showing people my scars and talking about it, and part of that was my doctor's emphasis on me owning it. And this is you, this is your life, these are your scars, you can tell them, you know, do whatever you want with it. And um, in reading some of the early works that Ted had, I, I was having a hard time, like, uh, maybe relating to some of the other people on the wall. And then it came back again, my doctor's words, this is yours. This is your story. It's not anybody else's story. So I think for a lot of people, everyone's gonna be a little bit different. For Ted and I, it was a very pleasant experience. We've done it a couple of times. We still hang out, we still do things together. So no, it, it, was, it, was, it was fine. It was, it was a good experience all around. Again, when, when people get to me, they, they're ready to talk. And what's so, you know, first of all, there's a couple other SCAR projects out there around the world. There's one in Australia, there's one in LA called One in Eight, which is just breast cancer. So, and, and they all take different directions in these. Most of the other ones are photos of people, they're very graphic, they show you all the damage to the body. And because mine goes in a different direction, again, because I'm more interested in the scar moving forward, um, a lot of people come to me because they, they want to tell their story without sort of the, the ick factor involved. So I do that. And that's why I leave the ink on the people, because I want you to see where the scar is. I wanted a geographic location, because when I first started this project, people would go, well, where on the body is that scar? You know, so this way you, could, you can see the color on the people without having to really see the, the damage. And I, to get back to your question, I think part of the reason people come to me is because I do have this empathy from being in the hospital. I always say I, can, I could go to any hospital, lie down on a gurney in the hallway and fall asleep because that's kind of where I grew up, you know. So I think for me it's... It's a mixture of all of it. I, I think that empathy thing is a huge part, and I've used that in my own practice, where I'll have a, you know, patients feel like they're the only one, even in, you know, with breast cancer, they don't know anybody else who's gone through that, or they're just seeing this long road ahead of them, and they're seeing that. And I have often, I do this often, and especially if you can find the right match of patients, have one patient, I'll say, you know, did you see that woman who just left looking great? She was where you were a year ago, and often I'll put them in the room together, and then I'll go to another room and see them and leave them alone and let them talk. And my patient, who's a year out, is happy to share her experience and show someone that, you know, this woman who's petrified of what's coming in the year, and in the middle of it, maybe her hair's already gone or whatever, and show her that the, there is light at the end of this. And maybe that's what your patients are doing here, are they're showing there's light at the end of this, mm -hmm. and sharing that for other people to look at it and say, okay, I can get there someday. You know, and I think that's very powerful. And it's powerful for both people that are already through it to see how far they've come and for the ones that are facing it. Yeah, and I'm always amazed how many of these people ask for the, normally I can do about eight prints with each of these because there's oil on the skin and as the oil dissipates, the ink tends to sort of build up. But I get about eight prints and usually the first print goes on my wall, the second and third that I do are usually the best ones and then the patient gets one of those. And about half the people have said, oh, I want one for my doctor. I want one to give to my doctor so they can have my scar on their wall. So they do think about you guys. Yeah. There's a meaningful relationship that you're building through every interaction. Um, 
in, in both fields. That's wonderful. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Does it ever make you guys upset that working through having a scar is so hard for patients? Because I know that there's a lot more than just the visual aspect, but do you ever, does it ever make you think, like, in an ideal world, this wouldn't matter as much as it does? I can answer that. In plastic surgery, there's a reason I'm not a burn surgeon. <laughs> because that is so devastating, and I just couldn't go to that point where there's really so little we can do for some of the devastating burns, and thank God there's people that can do that, there, where there's so little we can offer so much for some of the devastating burns. You know, so I think that's a, particularly an area that I would find very, very difficult to work in. You can only do so much. Yeah, I can speak to that from being a pediatric hospitalist and covering the burn service over at LA County. Um, we see some of the worst burns um, uh, we are the burn center for this part of the city, and we see pediatric patients who've been through devastating, life-altering uh, experiences, and they're in the ICU, number one, for weeks to months, uh, and then they come out of it being a completely different individual than going in, and there is a process that happens, and we are part of it. We started off, but um, it's a lifelong process of healing, you know, um, and... Um, just, just understanding it, just being aware of it, just um, knowing that there is a lot of um, work that needs to be done on the inside too, uh, and not just externally, can be um, some of the most important work we can do as pediatricians. I want to tell a story. Before I even started this project, I was doing work at Shriners with some of the severely burned kids there, and there was a little and. And as someone who wasn't used to being around Burns at that time, I sort of, every time I would go in and work with the kids, I would take about five minutes, I'd get there early, I'd sit in the corner and I would sort of look at them because I needed to take in what, it's sort of like you were saying, I needed to, okay, if I'm gonna be sitting right next to this kid, what am I gonna be seeing? What are the details of the burn? And then once I sort of processed it, then it didn't seem unusual. I, I could just deal with it. But there was one kid who came in who had, was a small kid from Mexico. His stepdad had lit the house on fire because he was angry at the mom and the kid was left in the house. His fingers were burned off, his whole face was burned and he had a pressure mask on his face so his face wouldn't swell. And I gave him a crayon and he just took the, the crayon between what was left of his hands and he started just going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know. so. So I'm looking at the scars and I'm thinking about all this damage and he's a little kid who wanted to draw. You know, so you always have to remember no matter what the external, the, the kid, the person is still in there, which is why Simi and Pam and I, we think it's so important to hear the stories, whether they're through a written narrative like Simi does or visually like I do. I think that's a really important part of empathy that you've just talked about. As medical students starting out, you are going into patient rooms where there is a deformity, there is something that you kind of feel like there is a bit of a shock about and you kind of have to steal yourself or, or be ready for it. But I think what you just mentioned, which is getting out of your own head, you know, just, just allowing for the person to be themselves and, and uh, not always feeling like my reaction is important or my reaction needs to be in the room, can yeah. sometimes help overcome. So Bruce, do you have any good reactions when you shake hands with someone and they realize that your hand feels completely different than? Um, I'm great at weddings, going through that line. <laughs> my friends would just sit back and just watch <laughs> how faces change. I try to bring my other hand up to kind of let them off the hook, to let them know it's, it's a little okay. I've had some first dates that ended abruptly. Which were, which were, you know, it's just like dodged a few bullets, but uh, yeah, it it's varies uh, because, and it's not something we're handshaky people, Americans especially, and so it's like, yeah, you get it all the time. It's like whoa, you know, it's like, and then everybody's like, what happened? Or some people are like. Don't, don't ask him. It's not, he was born that way, you know. <laughs> so, you know when my daughter was in elementary school, it was great because, you know, all the kids, they're unfiltered. Look at that guy's hand, Dad. But it's, you know, it's just something that, again, everybody's reaction is going to be different. And you, just like every patient's different, people coming at you, their uh, life experience up to that point, up to meeting you, 
is, is a little bit different. Question? Um, can you speak to, um, with uh, the people that you draw, um, at the end of the project, once they see the finished project, how they react, how they, you know, the, the cathartic moment maybe that they feel? Sure. Well, I think it, just like anything, I think it depends on the people. Some, so there's a couple different ones here. There's, uh, so the, there's a woman over here who had brain cancer who came to me just like three weeks before she died. And for her, it was important part of her legacy to know that she would be on a wall that traveled around and that her picture would be, she would be known in the future. So, and most of these photos, I do a regular photo shoot. But in her case, I only got off one photo because as soon as I took the picture, she started crying and talking about, you know, I know I'm going to die. And she had stage four brain cancer. I'm, you know, she, she said she thought she had two weeks. She landed up living, I think, four. But so for her, it was important. The guy passed her as an actor who had breast cancer. And he wanted this to be part of his legacy that for other men to be able to see, oh, you can get breast cancer too. So there's, there's that. They can be informational. They can be legacy. And then again, some people want to give them to their, their own doctor. So I think it totally depends on the people, you know. I don't know if that totally answers the question, but you know, everyone comes into it for a different reason, and it's part of their healing process, and I think they go out of it that way. I'd maybe ask also, like, do you see any transformations? Do you see anyone? Yeah, so yeah. this one behind me, this is a woman who, she, when she was 11 years old, her, a candle lit her bedroom on fire, and she was severely burned. And she had written me, there had been an article somewhere about my work she had seen. She wrote me and said, if you're ever coming to New York, I'd love to do a print. So I went to New York. I had a friend there, let us use his studio, and we did this print of her. So if you look at this print, you guys know that they wrapped her in sort of that mesh, so her skin looks very almost reptilian. And she wanted to be painted green. Everybody picks their own color. And she really looked reptilian with this green print and this sort of hatch pattern on her. But she walked in with her boyfriend and she was like this. She, her, again, her fingers had been burned off and she was sort of like this. And then by the end of the print, which took about an hour and a half because it was you know, very big and um, for her photo, She's like, I'm going to grab the fire extinguisher. Wouldn't that be great? And she went up to the wall. She grabbed the fire extinguisher off to kind of cover her breasts. And she was standing up straight. She was like this whole different person who had gotten this attention for something that they had tried to hide before. And I also did one, um, you, you will appreciate this one, at a, at a high school. And there was a girl who was very quiet. And she had a big scar like this on her stomach, almost like a question mark. And she got up in the class, she showed everybody her scar, and I said, what's it from? And she says, I have no idea, I was adopted. And the people that adopt me had no idea what this was about. So the teacher later came to me and said, she has never stood up in class before. She's never wanted to be the center of attention. But by talking about her scar, she got all this attention from the kids and apparently was very transformational to her. I like that, making the unseen seen and how that can just be healing. Um, do you have a patient story or an experience of that? I know you talked about the girls who are kind of like teenagers. hiding, the teenagers. You know, I think if you, the weight loss patients, to move to another whole thing, I mean, I am amazed by their transformations. And in that case, we, you know, we're talking about massive weight loss patients who've lost over 100 pounds, usually from having had some bariatric surgery. And the, I've, it's been 
really fun working with those patients. And they will take any scar over the excess skin and looseness. And they're often like, we're not necessarily that happy with it. Sometimes the results and we'll say, as plastic surgeons will say, you know, it's not as tight as I want or whatever. And they'll actually say, show my old pictures, Dr. Downey. I want to show you how much better I look than then, you know. <laughs> and things that they're doing um, that they couldn't do before and that we can offer with, you know, removing this excess skin and allowing them, as they put it, often, I look normal now. And that's all they want is that I just want to look normal. I don't want to have huge flaps of skin or the belly that's still there despite having a, I want to be normal. And that's, you know, what we're trying to achieve is just, you know, not the perfect, not the ideal, but mm -hmm. the normal. Yeah. And, you know, seeing that they're now, and they'll come in and telling me things that they're doing now that they've never done before. Mm -hmm. You know, everything from skydiving to just getting on an airplane with a regular seatbelt or, you know, just, I mean, every sort of thing and the transformation it's been. And they're proud of their scars. Often mm -hmm. they'll say, I don't care about scars. I want to, I'm proud. It shows the journey I've been mm -hmm. on. They're happy to be seen. Yeah. It's that uh, experience right. of being seen right. uh, and acknowledged. That's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I'll pass it on to Pam. On, so first of all, I just want to thank all of you. Um, Ted, your work is stunning. It's great to have it here. And a special thank you to Bruce for coming and sharing your story and Dr. Downey for your um, expertise and insight and Dr. Raman for your great um, facilitation. I think that um, one of the things that we've talked about before with, the, with these shows since Ted became our artist in residence is that we tie um, the exhibits to the student's core curriculum, and often it's organ system based, and this is a, a departure for us, and um, what I thought about as I was listening to you is that this is really um, something that kind of cuts across all organ systems, and we thought about, um, I think uh, you, students have studied some um, wound healing and, and in pathology that might or might not intersect, but um, the idea that these uh, stories uh, transcend and cut across all of our work is is really remarkable. And I would just encourage everyone, I, I haven't had a chance to read all the stories yet, but um, I, the art is so colorful, um, so just it's, it's aesthetically so interesting to come down here, but then when you realize that these are all human stories on the wall through Ted's um, beautiful work, I just um, think it's great, and I wanna thank you for for sharing it and um, thank all of you for coming. And if you don't have to race off and want to speak with any of us, please feel free to do so. Thanks. Thank you.